Paleo Runner Podcast is devoted to finding better ways to live, run, train, and eat. I'm your host, Aaron Olson. You can find more information by going to paleorunner.org. If you enjoy the show, please go to iTunes and leave a review. Search for Paleo Runner in iTunes and click Ratings and Reviews. You can also follow me on Facebook.com slash RunPaleo or on Twitter at RunPaleo. I wanted to take a minute to let you know about a product I've been using called 3Fuel. 3Fuel is a sports drink that gives you fat, protein, and carbohydrates to use as a fuel source. Unlike sugar sports drinks, 3Fuel gets absorbed slowly into your bloodstream to give you sustained energy throughout your workout. If you'd like to give it a try, you can get 10% off by using the coupon code 3FOLSON. Go to paleorunner.org and click 3Fuel at the top of the page. If you're listening through the podcast app on iPhone, click the link displayed on the app right now. My guest today is Dr. Michael Hollick. Dr. Michael Hollick is Professor of Medicine, Physiology, and Biophysics. During the past 25 years, Dr. Hollick has looked at how vitamin D is made in the skin during sun exposure and has become a globally recognized expert on vitamin D. Dr. Hollick, thanks so much for being part of the show. Oh, it's my pleasure, Aaron. So, Dr. Hollick, you know, a lot of people in the ancestral community are are kind of being inundated with this message of how important vitamin D is. Is it really the fountain of youth that it's made out to be? Well, I think that what is really, to me, remarkable is that we have evidence that vitamin D is probably the oldest hormone on this earth, that even the earliest life forms, phytoplankton in the ocean over 500 million years ago, were making vitamin D. Mm. And I think throughout evolution, vitamin D has played a very important role in certainly calcium and bone metabolism in vertebrates, including our early ancestors, um, and probably evolved into having a lot of other biologic effects as well. Okay. Okay. So you mentioned there that vitamin D is actually a hormone. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what kind of effects it has on the body? You mentioned calc- You mentioned bone formation, but hormones typically other ha- also have lots of other functions. Can you, sure. can you mention some of those? Absolutely. So it turns out that originally it was thought to be a vitamin because it was in cod liver oil. But once they realized that you could make it in your skin from sun exposure, instantly it became a hormone. Mm. And we now know that once you make vitamin D in your skin or you ingest it in your diet, it goes to the liver to be converted to 25-hydroxy vitamin D, the major circulating form that doctors order to determine a person's vitamin D status, and then to the kidneys to its active form, 125-dihydroxy vitamin D. It enters the bloodstream, goes to the intestine, and bone to help regulate calcium in your blood in order to mineralize the bone properly and also to maintain most metabolic functions. Okay. Separately, we're now recognizing that colon, prostate, breast, brain, as well as your immune cells like macrophages also activate vitamin D locally. And we did a study recently and showed that just improving vitamin D status in otherwise healthy adults who are vitamin D deficient, we were able to turn on and turn off about 291 genes that affect about 80 different metabolic processes. Wow. So that's the reason why we think vitamin D is so critically important for overall health and welfare. Okay, so there's uh, 290, you said, different... 291 different... genes that we identified as being changed in the way they're expressed by your DNA just based on vitamin D status in, in, in healthy, otherwise um, adult here living in Boston in the wintertime. Okay, so it, is there still a lot of research to be done on the, on the effects of vitamin D or do we already know what all those 291 effects are having. Correct. And so we did publish a paper on this that, that is um, actually online that um, your uh, listeners can get um, since it's PLOS 1, so it's free access. Okay. And we published it in 2013. Just pull up my name, Hollick. Mm-hmm. And um, and we showed all the different genes and we showed what those genes do. And, and we recognize that those genes control at least 80 different metabolic processes from DNA repair to responding to reactive oxygen uh, to altering cellular proliferation to altering immune function. Okay, okay. You know, if you just do a, a, a search for vitamin D on the internet, you'll find people saying things that it helps them get over colds faster. And it can even help with things like depression. Do you find those claims to be consistent with your findings? Right. So the, the data, there's a study done in um, Japan and they showed that school children that took 1,200 units of vitamin D a day for four months in the wintertime reduced their risk of getting influenza A infection. And they d- determined this by doing a blood test and nasal swab but looking for the virus hmm. by 42%. A study wow. done here in the Northeast showed that a healthy adults that maintained a healthy level of 25-hydroxy vitamin D on average of 38 nanograms per ml reduced their risk twofold of upper respiratory tract infections. There's good data 
data out there to show that vitamin D does help reduce risk of infectious disease and helps to fight infectious disease. Okay. So you mentioned in that study that there was 12, that they took 1,200 units of vitamin D. Do you have a minimum amount that you would recommend to people who want to, you know, are listening to this, they want to experience overall better health? I have a lot of endurance athletes listening to this who are out in the sun for maybe a couple hours, but I guess the, the daylight's getting shorter now, now as we move into the winter months. Um, how much should they should someone be consuming? Sure. So what I typically recommend uh, for parents that their children should be on a thousand units of vitamin D a day. Adults, two thousand to three thousand units of vitamin D a day. And even if you're you know a, an aggressive runner, but you're out there in the early morning and late afternoon, but but work in the daytime, mm-hmm. you basically cannot make any vitamin D in your skin before 10 a.m. and after 3 p.m. No matter where you are on the globe, even at the equator in the summertime. Okay. And we also know that if you live above Atlanta, Georgia, you basically can not make any vitamin D in your skin from sun exposure from about November through March. Okay. So it's very important to get it through diet or through supplementation. Is it possible to get it through supplemental foods? Right. So that's a, the additional problem. And that's why vitamin D deficiency is so common because everybody basically avoids the sun or they put a sun protection factor of 30 on, which reduces your ability to make vitamin D in your skin by more than 95%. And there's essentially no vitamin D in your diet. So yes, yeah, dairy products, some juice product contain 100 units in a glass. Mm. Even the Institute of Medicine recommends that children and adults should be 600 units of vitamin D a day. That would mean you would have to drink six glasses of milk a day. Wild caught salmon contains about 500 to 1,000 units in a serving, but you'd have to eat it every day. And mm. mushrooms exposed to sunlight or ultraviolet light will produce lots of vitamin D, and so that that's an additional source. But you basically cannot satisfy your body's vitamin D requirement from dietary sources, so you need a supplement. So what okay. I typically recommend, and I personally take myself, is 3,000 units of vitamin D a day. I have all of my patients on 3,000 units of vitamin D a day, and they're all doing great. Okay. And you mentioned there that we a lot of times are told to put on sunscreen when we go outside. Um, is there any risk of getting skin cancer if we if we don't lather up with sunscreen? Sure. And so the answer is that just like anything else in life, moderation, that I typically recommend sensible sun exposure. And what that means is that you can go out for about half the time that it would take to cause a mild sunburn, arms, legs, abdomen, and back, but always protect your face. Most sun exposed and most sun damaged. Also, if you have increased skin pigmentation, you also natural sunscreen, so you need to be outside probably three to five times longer than a white person to make the same amount of vitamin D. Mm-hmm. So to help people with this issue, I'm working with a group in uh, Southern California, and we've developed an app called dminder.info, so D-M-I-N-D-E-R.info. And if you go to that website um, and to that app and you dial in, it'll tell you how much vitamin D you're making, and it'll also warn you that you've made enough and that you should now wear sun protect so you can take advantage of the beneficial effect, prevent the damaging effect from excessive exposure. Oh, wow. That's that's a great idea. I'm, I'm going to download that app. Um, are, there, are there differences between getting vitamin D from the sun and getting vitamin D from a supplement? Good question. We think that in terms of your bone health, for sure, that, that the two are fine, that sun exposure, making vitamin D, and vitamin D you take from diet and supplements are, are the same. But we also know when you're exposed to sunlight, you make a lot of other photoproducts of vitamin D. And we're beginning to realize that some of them have unique biologic properties that you would never be able to get from a supplement. And so mm-hmm. it may be that making your vitamin D from sun exposure has some additional benefit above and beyond just making vitamin D. Okay. You know, I, I've actually bought one of the products that you, I, I think you helped work on. It's called the Spurdy Vitamin D Lamp. Now, is that going to give me the same effect as going out in the sun? I do. That. Okay. Yeah. So the Spurdy Lamp is the only FDA sanctioned lamp available in the United States that does produce vitamin D, and you're correct, we've been using it. And um, we usually typically recommend to our patients, especially those that either want to make vitamin D naturally or if they have any kind of malabsorption problems, they can't absorb dietary or supplemental vitamin D, is expose your abdomen and, and uh, thighs uh, for the amount of time recommended by the manufacturer, mm-hmm. um, two to three times a week. And what you could do is you could switch off your back and the back of your leg versus your abdomen and your thighs every couple of days. And that usually will make a reasonable amount of vitamin D. Uh, we did a study and showed that if you were to go out on the beach in a bathing suit and get a light pinkness to your skin 24 hours later, it's equivalent to ingesting about 15,000 to 20,000 units of vitamin D. Okay. So by using that spurty lamp, you're probably making about two to 3,000 units a day. Okay. Will going in a, a tanning salon help? 
So we did a study in tanners in Boston several years ago because I was curious about that. And tanners, when you use a lamp that puts out UVB, so you never want to use a tanning bed that only has UVA. It's the most damaging to your skin and produces no vitamin D. Okay. But those that put out UVB will definitely produce vitamin D. And we showed tanners in Boston in the wintertime had robust healthy levels of 25 hydroxy vitamin D on average about 48 nanograms per ml. And we took both men and women, matched them for sex and age for those that didn't go to a tanning salon. On, their average blood level was 18 nanograms per ml. They were all vitamin D deficient. Hmm. So there may be something to, to people that use a tanning bed infrequently. It will definitely maintain their vitamin D levels in a healthy range. Okay. And is there a way that listeners can find out whether the tanning bed is UVA or UVB? Well, usually if it's a fluorescent tube as opposed to these round lamps, it uh-huh. automatically tells you that it's going to be a UVA, UVB bed. You should be able to ask the proprietor of the tanning salon um, what kind of beds they have. Often, sometimes they'll have different types of beds. So they have what are called high-intensity um, UV beds. And like I said, there are these round lamps. Don't be exposed to them. And definitely don't expose your face to them. It'll cause skin wrinkling and potentially increase risk for melanoma. Okay. Um, you know, you mentioned some of the benefits are, are definitely bone health. You mentioned that uh, people are less likely to get the flu or colds. Are there any other surprising results that you found from working and studying uh, vitamin D that sure. that are I mean, basically, vi- yeah, vitamin D yeah. is critically important from birth until death. So we showed, for example, that women who are vitamin D deficient are more likely to develop preeclampsia, the most serious complication of pregnancy. Mm. Also, vitamin D is critically important for muscle function. So it was not a surprise to us that in over 200 women at our hospital giving birth, if they were vitamin D deficient, they had a 400% less likelihood of requiring a C-section. Wow. We believe that in utero, vitamin D deficiency for the infant is going to um, potentially cause more uh, issues for birth outcomes. Vitamin D deficiency in utero is associated with poor birth outcomes, mm. increased risk for wheezing disorders during the first few years of life, and asthma. We mm. also know that if you live above Atlanta, Georgia, and um, for the first 10 years of your life, you have a 100% increased risk of developing multiple sclerosis for the rest of your life. Really? A study done out of Harvard Nursing health study showed nurses that had the highest intake of vitamin D reduced their risk of developing MS by more than 40%. Study in Iowa showed reduced risk of rheumatoid arthritis by about 44%. We also um, showed in teenage boys and girls living in Georgia, African-American boys and girls, giving them 2,000 units of vitamin D a day for several months actually improved their vascular blood flow, that there was less resistance in their blood vessels, meaning less likely to develop hypertension and heart disease. A study done at a Framingham Heart Study they showed if patients were vitamin D deficient, 50% higher risk of having a heart attack. Also, depression, schizophrenia, Alzheimer's disease has been associated with vitamin D deficiency. And finally, 33% reduced risk of getting type 2 diabetes if you simply increase your calcium and vitamin D intake based on the National Health Survey data. Wow, that's those are pretty incredible findings. Now, that last one, you mentioned that you should increase your calcium and vitamin D, it, but is do you have to be careful when taking calcium if you're also taking vitamin D? D because of the increased absorption? Good question. And it turns out the answer is no. But the problem often is that people think a little is good, a lot is better. And so they're taking now much larger doses of calcium. You should, I always recommend for my patients 1,000 milligrams a day, preferably from dietary sources. So for example, a glass of skim milk contains 300 milligrams of calcium. Orange juice fortified with calcium, 300 milligrams of calcium. But if they can't get it from diet for whatever reason, then to take two 500 milligram vitamin D pills with your meal to take one, say, in the morning or, or at lunchtime and one with your dinner mm-hmm. will satisfy that requirement. And that having any amount of vitamin D will not cause you to have any problem with calcium. Okay. And Dr. Hollick, do you use the lamp or do you use supplements? Personally, I take 3,000 units of vitamin D a day. I love to play tennis. I cycle and I garden, sunscreen or sun protection on my face or broad brim hat when I'm in the garden, mm-hmm. And um, but not on my arms, legs, abdomen, and back. Okay. Never get a sunburn. Okay. Okay. Well, Dr. Hollick, it was very interesting talking with you today about your findings. What are you working on next? What do you have going right now? Well, what we're interested in is, are, are two areas. We're beginning to develop a more personalized um, vitamin D producing device mm-hmm. that a person could potentially strap on themselves and turn it on for a minute or two and make their vitamin D and it'd be just like being in close to sunlight and then you're good for a couple of days. Wow. Okay. We're also looking at the role of vitamin D 
versus vitamin D3 and their effect on the immune system and gene expression. Uh, also looking at the bioavailability of vitamin D in mushrooms. Turns out that mushrooms exposed to sunlight or ultraviolet light, which is now available in your produce section in your supermarket, uh, actually does um, provide you with your vitamin D, that the vitamin D in mushrooms is perfectly bioavailable. Wow. And vitamin D2 is as effective as vitamin D3 in maintaining your vitamin D stat to take in the physiologic dose. Okay, so you mentioned there are mushrooms just available in, in the grocery aisle. So pr pretty much all mushrooms are exposed to sunlight. Is that what you're saying? So the, the, the mushroom industry realizes that this is an opportunity. So some mushroom growers are now exposing their mushrooms to ultraviolet light before they package them up. And so if you go to your supermarket, you'll see on the on the label that these are UV exposed mushrooms and that mm. they contain 500 units of vitamin D. If it mm. doesn't say that, that means that they don't. And so what we're in the process of doing right now as part of the app I told you about mm -hmm. is that we're trying to develop an app so you put your mushrooms outside to make vitamin D. Okay, interesting. Well, thanks so much for being part of the show, Dr. Hollick. Where do you recommend people go to find out more about you and your work? Yeah, the best place to go would be to my website, which is just E-R-H-O-L-I-C-K dot com. Okay. Lots of information. My New England Journal review uh, is available for free, as well as out one hour stream presentation, several of them that I've given over the past couple of years, is all available on that website. Okay, great. Well, thanks so much for being part of the show. My pleasure. You've been listening to another episode of Paleo Runner Podcast. For more information, go to paleorunner.org. Thanks for listening.